We really never stopped. We released the first movie and went right into the development and production of the second one. So it wasn't like, I actually had a week off. I don't think Sam had a day off. So, uh, you know, it was a kind of continuum. So we're a little shop. Not quite in the same way, say, Peter Jackson and Lord of the Rings. It's not as if we were making the movies simultaneously, which would, in a sense, be a luxury. It would be nice to have known at the outset what the first three movies were going to be and, and have that overview. You know, in some ways, that would have been a benefit that we didn't have. But in other ways, there's the fun of doing it, seeing what you've learned, taking that, and, you know, moving forward. Uh, I need New York speed. This is L.A. speed. Okay. <laughs> faster moving, everyone. The other thing that serves us is in most areas, we've all worked together before. The more people I find that I can work with that I feel comfortable with that deliver great artistic results, I try and never let them go. I try and always make my movies with them. And I'm finding a lot on this picture. There's so many people involved in Spider-Man 2. It's so, I mean, Spider-Man 1 as well, but, but it's just incredible like to think about every little, every little moment is drawn, you know? It's, it's just, it's pretty incredible. They kind of, in the beginning, you, the temptation, and you should do it, is to throw everything in the kitchen sink in there in, the, in regards to the different looks and, and what you want. And then it's just a reeling back process and what do we need them to do? I'm an illustrator for this show, uh, one of three or four, and our job is to uh, illustrate uh, certain images that they want to occur in the course of the movie. You know, they're usually a dramatic image. It's necessary um, on this complex of a movie in terms of shooting because, you know, you've got CG elements mixed in with stunts, uh, so you have to be pretty precise about what you shoot. You know, you can't just go like, oh, we think this is a good plan, so we're going to go ahead and do it. I'd like to think that we're taking it just a little bit further um, than in the comic books, because obviously they're, they're, they're dealing with narration of story and flow of story, and we're just dealing with an isolated scene. So uh, we get a little more time to really, you know, in, in, embellish on the, on the look of it. What we do is uh, work with the production designer and uh, art directors to uh, visualize what they want to see, what they want to show to the director. And uh, we basically go and meet with them and they let us know roughly what they want to see and we, we illustrate it so they can print it out and uh, show the director, see if that's the direction he wants to go in. It's great to have so many years of fantastic material to base the movies on and so many great pictures and story ideas. But finally, when it comes to production design, Neil really has to start from scratch and determine what is the world that our movie takes place in. It's my fourth movie with Sam, and um, there's a trust level there that you cannot, um, you can't gain it any other way than spending a lot of time working with someone. Um, he is very giving in that he gives you a clue as to what he wants and then you run. He really de finally determines the look and um, was right there on top of every decision. And it's a very consistent New York that he's created. It's not an absolutely real New York, nor is it uh, some New York of fantasy. What was great about having something as loose as it was at the beginning is that you can offer up as many ideas as you want and throw things into the pot and some things were useful, some things weren't, but it it's a, a much more, certainly a much more energetic process when you have um, a looser framework when you're starting because you can add and subtract things and inspire new ideas. There are over a hundred sets and locations and some are just a street corner in New York and some are, you know, entire streets. There were Probably 10 major sets, enormous big sets, but lots of little tiny ones, bits and pieces. The art department is, their job basically is to manifest the physical reality of what a movie is and where they're going to shoot it, whether it's a location or a set on stage. 
And so most of it occurs in Spider-Man either in New York or on a stage set here in Los Angeles. And for any stage sets, we start off with uh, reading the script and seeing what the requirements are. And our production designer will do uh, a meeting with uh, Sam and have a, uh, a rough sketch or an idea. And then from that rough sketch or an idea, we build upon that by developing other sketches and renderings. And then we do paper models In front of me are a number of the models of the sets I've been working on. The model tells us a number of things. The first thing it does is it helps the designer see the space, see the detail level, the draftings that we do to make the model become the draftings that we're going to give the construction shop to actually build the final set. One of the things we always try to make for the model is we try to make the walls wild, which is our term for a piece that can come away. Um, which will match the walls that will be wild when we build the final set so that the director can see exactly what his framing will be. We know that we've built enough set. We, we know that the composition is just what he wants for the final frame. Also, we might do a 3D model to pre-visualize what that set will be. We're doing most of the filming here in Los Angeles, so uh, we have to bring New York back to the stage. We're after a stylization of New York, more of a comic book uh, version. So we photograph uh, backings or views of New York. Once we design the skyline, we're, we're able to test this, uh, test the view by building the set actually in the computer. We build a computer generated version of our interior and we're, we place this image outside the window and look around and see that everything looks good. See in the old days, this would have been just Xeroxes on cardboard in front of a paper model. And the paper models are still very, very useful for us. But for the specific views, uh, there's such an investment in these backings, it's that um, it's good to get them right. And then ultimately, this will be printed on a large piece of backlit vinyl. Here we have, oh, a couple of hundred feet of image. Uh, 34 feet high. And we will then move into architectural draftings of the set. A lot of times we'll do schematic drawings that are given to the model makers to build models from. And then they'll come back and we'll kind of develop it back and forth. These kind of drawings are just for the skin. The furniture and the, the paper and that stuff is done by set dressing. We knew that um, certain sets from the first Spidey would return, like Aunt May's house and um, Norman's den, which would then become Harry's den. So we knew that we were going to take that set and rework it a little bit and, you know, make it become part of the next movie. So those sets fit a category, things we knew we were reusing and working. Um, and then there were, you know, certain sequences that Sam felt mildly sure about. For instance, the end sequence, um, he had said, you know, give it some thought. Where do you think the final battle should be? We know we'll have one. So I suggested up here, and that seemed like a good idea. Everyone was very excited about it. The whole movie was on hiatus for about eight weeks while that set was being built. And uh, we all came back after eight weeks, and. The first day I was back, I came back the day before we started work on the set, and um, I went to have a look at it, uh, and I was stunned. I mean, it's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful set. The pier was to be a more exploded version of the lab, and a more, fall. you know, his life has fallen apart, it's become evil, and the scale of it, though, is, is several times bigger. It's about 60 feet by 120 feet by about 40 feet tall here on stage 30. Um, we opened up the pit at uh, the east end so that as you look down towards that end of the pit, the floor has broken away and you can see into the water. It's probably ended up being about 15 weeks of building um, when we started prepping and building each individual column and bracket and we uh, put up the big high trusses first 
and uh, then sort of built down to the floor and then into the pit where we had to do a rock formation to hide the pit walls uh, so that uh, it appears as though the, the pier has not only gotten crushed on the side but has fallen down. So a lot of the walls and trusses were put in at um, funny angles so that it all looks like it's crushed and damaged. It's not only been built here in full scale, but we're building a miniature interior and exterior for plate shots, placing it you know, on the edge of the river and, uh, and to see it collapse and go into the river at the end of the sequence. You're divvying up all the projects to as many people as you can in order to make the, the project get finished, but then you also want everyone to contribute and keep all their ideas going the same route. So we jump around a lot. We spend a lot of time with a lot of people and, you know, guide it toward the end. And what's interesting is that it's not always exactly what you envisioned. Usually it's better. Usually it's more interesting because people bring things to the table.